sharing my screen. So can you see my screen? Yes, we see it. Okay, good. So uh, you you just have received a, a, a message from uh, Birgitte uh, saying uh, uh, the information about the this course. So uh, you have gotten uh, this uh, document uh, analyzing the data in HPC environment using R. And uh, here you can see uh, who are the instructors for, for this course? Uh, it is uh, Henrik Sassi from PDC at KTH, uh, my colleague Birgitte Birze, and, and I, uh, Pedro Ojeda. So, uh, in this document, you can find the schedule for uh, today and tomorrow, and also some important links uh, for R in our cluster, uh, which is Kep de Kaise. So here are some, uh, there are some uh, guidelines for uh, how to use R, right? Also uh, the important information for this course and uh, some setup that uh, you should have uh, follow. Otherwise you can follow the, that uh, during uh, the uh, exercises. And uh, also some information about Ubuntu. Uh, for the R course, and and this is a a, a document that we uh, elaborated, and uh, very important, uh, uh, there is a GitHub repository, right? If you click on this link, you will see uh, the repository for this course, and if you go to uh, presentations then you will see the PDF files for uh, the lectures and the, the labs that we will have. Uh, also very important, uh, here there is a, a, a question section where you can write your question and your answer. And this is a HackMD document in, in case uh, that you haven't used that before. I can show you that uh, quickly. You can go to, uh, let me see, edit. If you click on edit, then you will see these three uh, uh, boxes here. You can uh, visualize only the document, right? Or you can uh, visualize the render document and also the editable uh, document. Here you can write your question, right? And uh, ask something like first, and then it will appear on this side. So sometimes uh, uh, writing the, the document uh, uh, creates some issue when the two persons are writing on the same line, for instance, or this document is not well synchronized. And something that helps is that you can go to a, a visual a mode, and then you go back to the editing mode, right? This can help in case uh, there are some uh, synchronicity issues. So uh, I think this is the information we are recording uh, this, this course, right? And do you want to say some words about the recording, Birgitte? Uh, yeah, I mean, we are recording this, yes. And uh, we are only recording the lectures. And after the course, we will uh, put these recordings on uh, YouTube. So if you don't want to be recorded, you should uh, keep your microphone off and also your camera off and then you will not be recorded uh, the exercises the recording may run there but we will not uh, do anything with this recording we'll just delete it so the only recordings that will be put on uh, hbc twins youtube channel are the one for the lectures so otherwise you are safe 
So, okay, uh, I think this is the information that uh, you need for uh, this course, right? And then I can move to the first presentation, which is uh, what is a parallelization? Let me see, what is my presentation? Okay. This one. Uh, yes, uh, we will talk about uh, uh, different uh, techniques, yes, uh, to uh, make your code faster. And also uh, one, one of them is, uh, uh, how to parallelize the uh, R code, right? R is a software that has been in, in the market uh, for about uh, 29 years, right? And it's a, uh, and because of that, it's a uh, quite uh, solid. It has a uh, many useful tools and also some extensions, right? That uh, make R uh, very powerful. So, but one uh, shortcoming of R is that uh, uh, sometimes it is slow in comparison to other codes, especially the low uh, level code like uh, Fortran and C++. But uh, I hope that we, in this course, uh, we show you uh, different techniques to make uh, your code faster. So uh, we will start with the parallelization. And first, we need to define what is parallelization. So uh, in order to do that, we will cover uh, uh, four topics, like uh, the introduction to uh, supercomputers, also two uh, uh, parallelization schemes, which are called the shared memory, computing and distributed memory computing. And then uh, in the last part, I will show you the concept of scaling. So what is a supercomputer? Or uh, first, where, when you can use a supercomputer? Uh, imagine that you are working on your laptop or your PC and at some point uh, you want to, to run your script and it simply uh, it breaks. And uh, you, it, it says, for instance, in your R or RS2 session that uh, you are running out of memory or simply you, you start running your script and it takes uh, uh, several days. And in the meantime, you cannot use uh, your, your laptop for uh, doing your 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 other work like uh, opening the word or some uh, other uh, programs, right? So in that case, if the program is too large, you need, for instance, a large database. Then a single computer uh, could be an issue. Also, requiring a lot of time in your laptop could be uh, some issue. Uh, for your uh, workload. So uh, in a traditional or a sequential processing, right, we have a problem, right, like a, a, a one R script, which uh, performs several tasks. And uh, one of them could be uh, reading a data frame or doing some manipulation. Uh, on, on the uh, initial data, right? And uh, there could be uh, many tasks. And if you don't do anything to your R code, in general, it'll we, it will uh, run on a single uh, CPU, right? And uh, because of this ta task are serial, at the end, you collect the, the, the results. So uh, here is the concept of parallel processing. So instead of doing uh, this task sequentially, you divide the workload 
on uh, some number of CPUs. And then uh, the task on each CPUs will be computed right in parallel mode. And each CPU, which have some part of the of the result, right? Some partial result. And some uh, uh, in some way, you collect the all all the results from all the CPUs, and uh, you get the the final result. And by doing this, uh, you uh, divide the total simulation time into n processes. So this will be the ideal case because we will see later that uh, uh, the ideal case is uh, almost never satisfied. So then uh, you can uh, take advantage of uh, the, the CPU uh, power, the computing power. For instance, if your R script is doing a lot of uh, numerical computations, but also you can uh, take advantage of the memory, right? Because for instance, using uh, two uh, CPUs uh, gives you more uh, memory for, for your code. So uh, here is an illustration of what is a, a cluster. So these are the so-called the cores, right? Which perform the uh, operations uh, that you uh, write on your code. And uh, these cores are, are uh, collected or they are, they are bound to the so-called a CPU, right? So some years back, or some decades back, this CPU uh, contained only one core. It was a single core, right? But uh, nowadays, uh, the CPUs contain uh, several cores. And uh, for instance, uh, uh, your cell phone or your laptop, uh, in general, if you take a look at the specifications, you will see that they contain uh, many cores, right? And that's why now you can experience, you can have a better experience with a different packages like a Word, a PowerPoint. You can open two applications and you don't see a delay as a, 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 a in the nineties, for instance. I remember it was quite slow, but now it's better. And also in the cell phones, yeah. So uh, these CPUs are. Uh, also uh, integrated into a larger piece or hardware, right? It's a, like a box and uh, they are called nodes, right? And these nodes are organized into uh, piles, right? And, uh, and they form a rack like this. And uh, the collection of these uh, racks is called the, the cluster. Right? And this is uh, what we uh, have here uh, in Kebnek Kaise and also in the machine in PDC, which is the Darden. So, what is an HPC cluster like a Kebnek Kaise or Dardel? This is a collection of uh, basically normal computers. Uh, the main difference is that uh, the computers that uh, the computers only have the the operating system. There is not a a, a, a screen, for instance, attached to these uh, computers as in your laptop, right? So, and also uh, they are uh, connected uh, with some uh, specific mechanism. So uh, the performance in an HPC cluster or in any uh, CPU uh, can be measured by the number of floating point operations per second. So uh, sometimes you will see this uh, abbreviation, the flop uh, per second or a flop in capitals, right? And this is a, a metric that is used to, to uh, measure the performance of your, your code or your application. 
So in an HPC cluster, there is a fast interconnect, right? So that uh, one can send messages from one node to the others in a very fast uh, way. Uh, there is some software uh, to manage the communication across the node. And uh, because there are many computers connected together uh, and they need to be uh, uh, managed in some, in some way, in some a very specific way. So there is a workload manager. So for instance, if you live in a, a building, right, that uh, provides you with some uh, laundry uh, machines, then there should be a mechanism to book the machine so that uh, your neighbors or, or you uh, cannot uh, interfere with the time of the order. So basically, this is something like a, a workload manager. So uh, here is uh, the HPC uh, development over the years. And this plot is, is uh, uh, obtained uh, from the top 500 uh, list, which makes a ranking, uh, I think uh, twice per year, of the fastest computers in the world. And they put uh, uh, the number one, for instance, and also the number 500 uh, and the sum of all of these machines in, in performance. And the, I remember they used to put some uh, better uh, 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 result plots, right? But uh, here you can see that uh, we have the floating point operations, but in terms of petaflops, and teraflops, right? Petaflops is 10 to the uh, 15 uh, flops, and teraflops is 10 to the 12 uh, uh, flops. So uh, for instance, uh, your laptop or a, a standard laptop would be the uh, supercomputer number 500, right, in 2003. And it will it would be a top supercomputer in the ninety seven. So this uh, the standard laptop that uh, one see it is today. So this is the top list uh, or the the first uh, five uh, computers, right? And you can see here uh, what is the number of cores. This the, the 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 unit of hardware that I showed you before for the uh, uh, top uh, supercomputer it's about eight millions and the number of petaflops is one one thousand around one thousand petaflops per second and uh, yes we have one machine. Uh, very close to us uh, in Sweden. And then this machine is, is located in Finland and it's called Lumi. And this is in the number, uh, the number three in this list. And this was up to November, 2022. So in our case, uh, our cluster is called Kemnekaise. It has uh, 600, around 600 nodes. And this number of, of cores and the peak performance is 980 uh, teraflops per second. Right? And uh, our machine here, it's a, a, a mix or hybrid machine because it contains uh, uh, different types of nodes. And in particular for the standard nodes, uh, we have the so-called Broadwell uh, processors, and uh, there are uh, 400 nodes, uh, which contains 120 gigabytes per node, right? So you can benefit from this memory in your R code, for instance. There are also some uh, uh, nodes which contain the uh, GPU cards, and also, uh, 20 nodes, which uh, can achieve up to uh, three terabytes per node, right? 
in case you have a very big database, yes, that is a memory expensive. So uh, let me see, there is uh, one question. Oh no, it's the Q&A uh, document, okay. And uh, here is uh, this, uh, here there are the specifications of Dardel. It contains uh, is, uh, around eight hundred nodes, and this amount, of course, and it can achieve uh, three thirteen point five petaflops. And this is the node configuration for, for Dardel. They are using AMD Epic, right? And uh, notice here that. Uh, the CPUs contain uh, up to 64 uh, cores. In the case of Kaimnekaise, uh, you can get up to 28 uh, cores per uh, CPU. And this is the RAM specification for, for Dardel. Uh, very interestingly, uh, they use AMD uh, GPUs. Yes. Let me see, and uh, now uh, we will start with the uh, two levels of parallelization, right? Or two schemes of, of parallelization. And the first one is the so-called uh, mem shared memory computing. So uh, uh, we provided you uh, with a, a HackMD a document, right? And, and this is uh, similar to what happens in shared memory. So there is some space, in this case, memory space, where uh, one can write, right? So all the participants, in this case, the CPUs, in HackMD, the people, right? They can write on the same uh, document. And uh, this is yeah, very useful because in that case, all the CPUs or the participants know what is happening with the same document, right? And uh, because of that, uh, they, they, they can uh, get some uh, benefits, right? From uh, the data transfer, because essentially there is no data transfer. So, uh, this can be executed on the standard computer. And as I said uh, before, so each process can read and write on the same uh, data. So there is no need to move the data because all the, the processes or the participants can, can get access to uh, the same data. They share the same memory address space, right? But it's, it can be difficult to manage concurrent access because of the so-called race conditions. Imagine that on the HackMD document, uh, two, two persons uh, try to write at the same time on the same line. So you will see some uh, conflict and then uh, uh, some, uh, some person needs to stop writing and, and then the other can and proceed. This is the so-called race condition. And it occurs also in this type of uh, shared memory uh, process. So in the case of distributed uh, memory, so the uh, layout is different because in this case, all the, the participants have uh, a, a own copy of uh, the, the data. Right, and this is uh, something like uh, when you are writing a research paper, and uh, initially, all the the people, all the participants, or the researchers get the same word document, and then they, they just start working on their own on on uh, their own document, and they 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 do some uh, modifications on the on the uh, their own documents. So uh, because all of them have uh, uh, their own copies, right? So uh, then 
at some point they need to synchronize with the changes of the order. So for instance, your advisor can ask you for your changes, uh, please send me this figure so that I can put it here or what is this reference? So you need to exchange information. And because of that, uh, sometimes uh, uh, this could be slower than doing the shared memory. But uh, the good point of distributed memory computed is that it's very scalable. As you remember, for Dardel, you have up, up to 60, 64, 64 cores, right? So uh, all the processes can share a memory, yes, uh, only up to 64 uh, uh, limit. And in Kemnekaise is 28, right? So uh, it, uh, shared memory is limited by the number of, of uh, uh, cores that, that, that can share the same address of memory. But in the case of distributed memory, it, it can scale up to uh, millions of cores, right? Because uh, all the day, all the uh, the processes have their own data, and they exchange at some point the information. So uh, here, communications need to be explicitly managed by the programmer. So the, these are the two uh, uh, parallelism schemes, right? But the and nothing inhibits you from doing some uh, combinations or the so-called hybrid uh, parallelism. So in that case, you can use uh, some uh, uh, communication between the nodes, right, to achieve the scalability. But at the same time, within each node, you can use some uh, shared memory to get the 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 speed, the, 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 the fast memory transfer, the, the fast memory, yes, that is available on the uh, uh, local uh, cores. So, but uh, this uh, uh, scheme, of course, uh, involves the, also the shortcomings of these two uh, methods, right? So you need to deal both with the shortcomings of distributed memory and also from the shared memory. And also to, you need to, to, to be a, a knowledgeable about these two memory schemes. So uh, now let me go to scaling, right? So, and in this case, uh, 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 I have had in the past uh, 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 questions from uh, not only our users, but from all, all other packages and say that they have some uh, script and uh, they, they think that if they request for more processes, then they will reduce the simulation time and get a, a faster performance. But uh, this is not the, the case. Uh, first of all, your code needs to be aware of the uh, architecture of the machine so that it knows that it can be uh, run on, on that uh, architecture. And also it needs to be aware of the parallelization scheme, either uh, shared memory or distributed memory. Also uh, notice that uh, uh, some parts of the code uh, cannot be parallelized, right? It's like, uh, again, when you are writing uh, uh, your, your, pre, your, your paper and uh, one copy is in your, the hands of, of your advisor and the other copy is in your hands, for instance, and then you want to do some change, but uh, this part can only be done by your advisor, right? Or, or, or it can be it can be done only by your student. So, uh, this part cannot be parallelized, and it needs to run only on a single core. So we need to be aware of this part, 
and also uh, that creating some uh, parallel uh, processes uh, makes some overhead, right? So uh, uh, because there are some special uh, libraries to parallelize the code, and then they do some uh, work under the hood. So they need to distribute the work and create some uh, layers, for instance, and this, all of this causes some overhead in the parallel process. So uh, this is a computational uh, dilemma. So uh, some languages uh, allows you for easy writing of code and also some uh, flexibility in writing. And for instance, here we can find Python, uh, MATLAB, R, JavaScript. There is also some combination of these uh, uh, languages, right? And if you want performance, then uh, you need to go to code, uh, languages like C, C++, Fortran, Assembler, right? And uh, for instance, noble languages such as Julia try to make a, or link this gap between these two uh, uh, programming uh, dilemmas. So uh, here I show you a very important plot, which is a scaling, yes? And uh, you will see these this, uh, plots in HPC reports, yes? And uh, when you use uh, HPC uh, centers, because here we plot the number of cores, right? On the X, X axis. And on the Y axis, we plot the so-called speed up. And the speed up is just the time that your simulation takes with one core divided by the time the code takes uh, by using n number of cores, right? Or in this case, processes, which is essentially the same, yes, for in this context. So uh, here, uh, in the ideal case, you will see a, a straight line, right? because it means that if you go from one uh, process to two, you will get twice the speed up and so on, right? But uh, in general, this is not the case. And what you will see is some uh, a cure that at some point with some number of processes, it reaches a, a plateau and you cannot get any uh, speed up Order. So uh, here, for instance, we show you uh, 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 the plot where 50% uh, of the code can be parallelized. Uh, you see that after uh, something like uh, seven yes, or five uh, number of processes, you cannot get any, any speed up order. And in the case of 99% uh, of the code that can be parallelized, it can be up to 60 and then it reaches a plateau. So uh, more deeply, right? Uh, it, is, it can be explained by the so-called AMDAS law and it has this expression, right? You, uh, you can take a look uh, uh, on uh, the internet about this, uh, how, how people get this expression, right? But essentially it tells you that the speed up depends on the uh, number of, of processes, which is uh, denoted by S, and also uh, it depends on uh, P, which is the proportion of the, uh, the, the code that can be uh, parallelized. So how can we apply this uh, uh, formula? So imagine that you have a code, right? 
that takes the 10 hours. You run your R script and it takes 10 hours. And uh, by doing some uh, measurements, such as we will uh, show you in this course, you realize that you have, uh, for instance, uh, some loop or some function where you spent the eight hours, yes? But uh, also you realize that uh, this part of the code can be parallelized, right? And uh, because this part can be parallelized, then uh, uh, the P, which is the proportion of the parallelizable code is a uh, 0.8. And if imagine that I want you uh, uh, to use uh, 15 uh, processes. So S is 15, and then you will get around uh, uh, four times, yes, uh, speed up. So it means that it will run uh, four times uh, faster. So uh, notice here that uh, we would expect 15 times if everything uh, was uh, uh, ideal, as in this case. But because uh, there is some problem with the parallelization, some, for instance, some overhead, or uh, simply because uh, uh, we cannot get uh, this uh, uh, ideal case, we end up using just a, a 4x speed up, right? Uh, Okay, so I think uh, I finish at this point. Is there any questions about this part? Let me see in the chat. Okay, uh, Henry clarified that there are uh, uh, 20, uh, 128 cores per node because there are uh, two CPUs, okay? So, so how I escape this window? Okay, so. No questions at, at this point. Let me see in the chat. Okay, so uh, then we move on. Yes, to the next uh, presentation. I will stop sharing. There is now one question, I think. 